welcome uh, to uh, 6874, Computational Systems of Biology, uh, Deep Learning in the Life Sciences. So we're delighted you're here uh, for our very, very first lecture of the term. And many of you probably have already seen our course website where all of the lectures will be posted. It also has pointers to Stellar and Piazza. Stellar will be the site used for problem sets. and Piazza, you'll be able to ask questions, which our crack team of TAs will be prepared to answer for you. Um, 6.874 staff at MIT EDU reaches all of us. And so it's actually quite good to use that email address so that if one of us happens to be unavailable on a particular day, you actually get a timely response. And furthermore, you should have received a Google Cloud coupon if you're registered for the course in your email. Uh, you can sign up and get your Google credits. And this uh, Thursday and Friday, we're having recitations as a quick start. So if you come in with your laptop by the end of recitation, you will have completed um, a teeny tiny problem set zero, and you will have learned how to use a Google Cloud or CoLab. And our expertise at this term is, well, myself and Manolis uh, and uh, Tim here, uh, Satchit and Corbin. And so we have a, I'm just, it's a really great teaching staff, so it's, it was a pleasure to be able to recruit them to teach this course. Uh, recitations this week will be in 36156, and if you have extra questions, you can attend afterwards. And further office hours will be posted on the uh, course website. Now, we're applying deep learning technology to problems in bioinformatics in this class and comparing them to conventional methodologies. And as you can see from the plot behind me, the number of publications that are in bioinformatics that relate to deep learning is a significant fraction of all of the publications in, in deep learning. And so we're going to explore both the opportunities and the challenges of working uh, with this new technology in the context of problems in the life sciences. And I sometimes view deep learning is sort of a box of razor blades. You know, it's, it can be very powerful, but you have to know exactly how to interpret what you get out of these systems. Uh, to that end, uh, the tools you're gonna be using this term have been catalyzed by three discontinuities over the past years. One is that, of course, we can collect very large data sets, typically in bouncing is one such data set brought to bear on this, and many of them are open source, so we can uh, easily incorporate them. And third, uh, there are new kinds of high performance hardware out there that allows us to actually operate these systems at scale. And we'll be talking about all three of these things uh, during the term. And the result, as you'll see, uh, has been completely transformative in the way that we view some of the computational challenges in the life sciences. Now, your background. Now, we, I've taught this course uh, before, and what we find is that if you don't know how to program at all, this probably isn't the course for you. And if you don't know anything about biology, this probably isn't the course for you. We're sort of expecting a reasonably um, foundational level of knowledge in both computational skills, calculus, linear algebra, and sort of the equivalent of at least 701 kind of level biology. We'll help you with the rest, uh, but there will be programming assignments as we'll talk about presently uh, in the course. If you have any questions about your background, please feel free to come up after class and talk to me or one of the TAs. We'd be happy to discuss it with you. Uh, the great contribution for the course is there are gonna be four problem sets, each worth 10%. Uh, and they're going to be done, as we'll talk about in a moment, using uh, Google Cloud on Jupyter Notebooks. If you are a power user and you want to use a different environment, that's totally fine. It's just that we don't support any other environment, just because of the myriad different environments that are out there in the world. We know everything we give you will work on Google Cloud, because we have run it on Google Cloud. We have solutions that run on Google Cloud, even, surprisingly enough. Uh, so <laughs> we know everything runs on Google Cloud. Um, there are two quizzes. We call them quizzes because they're going to be relatively short quizzes. We don't want to stress you out. That's not our goal. Um, we're going to try and make them compact so you can easily do them within a normal lecture period. The idea is to just test some of your foundational knowledge. And there's going to be a final project, which is going to be done in teams of two. 
And uh, some of you are scribing. Hello, scribes, are you here today? Okay, we have some scribes uh, who are here today scribing, and there was a sign-up sheet sent out uh, for the rest of the term. And please feel free to sign up and scribe as your schedule permits. And we'll take the results of the scribing and make them available to the entire, entire class. Now, there are a lot of other MIT subjects. I put them up here, uh, not to go through them in detail, but just to say that uh, if this subject isn't quite your cup of tea, uh, there are other subjects that deal with, for example, more conventional methodologies uh, in computational biology, whether it be dynamic, appro dynamic programming approaches for sequence alignment or um, conventional kinds of, uh, say, RNA-seq analysis, uh, or they may assume much less in the way of, say, programming a background. But if you are interested in other courses, these slides are already posted on our website. You can look through these other courses and see if there's something else that uh, might be of interest to you. Uh, this is the general outline for the entire term. Uh, there are uh, basically uh, five modules uh, in the course. There's a machine learning introduction, just to make sure that we're all talking the same language about machine learning. Then we'll talk about gene regulation and chromatin structure. Um, we'll talk about the express genome uh, as an next module. We'll talk about human genetics, how human genetics impacts um, both disease and other high throughput measurements of, uh, of our phenotypes. And finally, we'll talk about therapeutics and diagnostics at the end of the course, how we can use machine learning in both of those uh, venues. And as you can see, there are corresponding problem sets on the left-hand side to go with each one of these modules. Uh, the first problem set is going to be the TensorFlow warm-up, where we're going to give you a series of uh, MNIST digits, and we're going to ask you to classify them. It's a fairly straightforward problem set. I think there's probably, I don't know, 40 lines of code they need to write. So, so 40 lines of code, something like that. It's not a lot of code, but it will cause you to sort of get into that environment and to sort of enjoy the beauty of what is TensorFlow. Um, and the next uh, module is going to be on uh, gene regulation. And to that end, we're going to give you a problem set that uses a uh, deep learning to explore the binding of transcription factors to the genome, which uh, participate in regulating gene expression. And so we'll be giving you high throughput sequencing data from chip chip experiments. And from that, you're going to be interpreting models to actually come up with the DNA sequences that those factors will recognize in the genome. And next, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the express genome. And as you're probably aware, single cell technologies are becoming increasingly important. So we'll be using some single cell RNA-seq data. The single cell RNA-seq data will be used in a problem set where we're going to have you implement a non-parametric <clears throat> uh, uh, clustering algorithm. Um, this uh, clustering algorithm is going to be unsupervised in the sense that we're not going to have labels. And you're going to find clusters of genes that cluster together using a TSNE algorithm. And finally, there's going to be a module on genetics, which is still under development. So we'll hear more about that a little bit later. And your programming environment for this course is going to be Jupyter Notebooks. How many people here have used Jupyter Notebooks before? Well, I would say that we're a good company then. Uh, the way that the problems will be delivered to you as a Jupyter Notebook, you can just download it. And there are going to be little bits in the Jupyter Notebook you need to fill in and run. And you will submit your Jupyter Notebook as your uh, homework um, completion. And the programming environment and computing environment will be on the cloud. Um, how many of you have used um, Google Cloud before? Uh, for, okay, so maybe one third. So this is a good way to sort of just get familiar with the new resource for you. Um, we're going to give you coupons so you can use the Google Cloud proper or you can use Colab, which is free. If you need more coupon dollars, you can come see us again. We have magic ways of communicating with Google to make more coupon dollars appear for you. So um, don't worry that it's only $50 you get at the outset. You say, How can I solve the world's problem from $50? No, no, don't worry. Uh, there is more if you need it. But just be mindful that uh, you, know, you, you do need, for example, not leave your machine running for a week while you're sort of off having you know, a good time someplace else. Because it will run in the background, believe me. It, you know, so you get your very own machine in the background if you want. And what's going to happen if you haven't already done it is you're going to click on that magic link that you were sent. You'll get a form like this, you fill it out. For you Harvard students, 
uh, on the right hand side where it says at mit.edu, that's a pull down menu. Just click on it and pull down and select Harvard. And it'll allow you to actually get your Google uh, coupon credits. And you'll get back an email with a long string of numbers and digits that you put into Google Cloud and it will charge up your account. Okay, so let's talk now a little bit about machine learning. Um, how many people feel like they're pretty familiar with machine learning? About half? Okay, for, for you folks, this will be a bit of a review. Um, and for the rest of you, this is going to be the, um, I would say the power introduction in the sense that just about everything I'm about to say for the next 50 minutes or so is going to be important for you to know. Okay? And furthermore, the way you choose to describe problems, if you use a framework like this, it shows a level of thought and sophistication that's important. So we just want to introduce this framework to you and the way that we think about this and some important metrics for machine learning so that going forward when we talk about evaluating the machine learning methodologies, we can have a common language for doing so. So what is machine learning? Well, it's converting experience into expertise or knowledge, or perhaps machine learning is um, computational methods using experience to improve performance, or machine learning might be building methods that can automatically detect patterns, or it might be uh, learning a task, uh, given uh, a set of feature inputs, making a prediction of an output. The way we're going to talk about machine learning is that we have a set of data, which is going to be some set of experience that we're going to build our machine learning methodology or model on. We have a very specific task. When you're thinking about machine learning, it's very important for you to clearly define your task. You know, what is the input and what is the output? And when you get that very clear in your mind, it's much easier to actually move forward and make progress on whatever challenge you have. And finally, there's going to be some performance measure at the end, allowing you to evaluate whether or not you're making progress on improving um, on your task. And the idea is that machine learning is using your experience to improve your performance on your task. Now the tasks we're going to talk about are varied. And so we'll begin talking about a couple simple tasks, but later on in the term, the task will be more interesting and, and, and complex. So in problem set one, we give you as an experience, which is a set of handwritten digits and labels for those digits. The task is classifying unseen digits as to what number they represent. And the performance metric is what fraction of the digits did you get right in the test set, right? So you have a training set, which is your experience you're building on, and then you are going to take that part of that set, hold it out, and use it as a test set to see how well you can do. So uh, our notation here, we're gonna be using a consistent notation in in the lectures so that you actually can understand what the variables are by looking at them. We'll talk about scalars, vectors, matrices, which typically are two-dimensional matrices, and tensors. What is the tensor? Well, a tensor is simply a matrix sort of arbitrary dimension. So it's nothing really that fancy. It's nothing to be afraid of, right? It's just a arbitrary higher dimensional matrix, typically. We'll also be talking about sets of objects. Now, when we describe a task, we'll be talking about the input feature range of them, which is the input space, and a particular data set, which is an example of that input feature space, and a label space. And a key idea is that when we're dealing with supervised learning, every single data set example has a label associated with it. And that allows us to learn from the features, how to predict labels for new examples we see that don't have labels. And we'll say that Y superscript sub I is the example of label, for example, YI. And the hat version of Y is what we predict the label to be if we hadn't seen it before. Okay, so then our 
overall goal is to discover a function uh, f that maps from this input feature set x into labels y. And there are many different ways that this kind of task can be called. Uh, we're going to be talking about mapping features into labels, uh, or we could talk about in other contexts mapping predictors into responses, uh, independent variables into dependent variables, regressors into, into a regress hand, input variables into target variables, and so forth. But the idea is fundamentally that we need to discover this function f that maps from our input features and our to our output labels. Now, later on, we'll talk about how do we discover which features are really important? How do we discover what F is really doing? How do we interpret F? And how do we use our knowledge to pick appropriate classes of F to use? So, you know, in our world right now, for today, we're gonna to think about Fs that are parameterized um, by a set of parameters theta, uh, which typically are weights and biases that are used by the model. Uh, and the, the model then is drawn from a particular hypothesis space about what we think is gonna be a reasonable set of functions to test to see if we can actually solve the task at hand. So when you hear the buzzword learning about learning, which you may have heard, learning about learning is trying to figure out which classes of functions are going to be appropriate for a particular task. So it's sort of meta-learning in the sense that we really want to understand which functions to try to fit to our features to actually make our predictions. Now, here is the data for problem set one. Right, it's uh, a set of digits um, that are uh, 28 by 28, and they're grayscale, so they're between zero and, and 256, actually 255, I think, right, in intensity. Uh, and we can consider to flatten those images, as you will do in problem set one, out to just a vector of length 784. And we'll give you a set of digits that have labels, and then we'll ask you to be able to take a, a digit with an unknown label and predict what the digit is. And so the way that this is represented then is you can think of the, each one of the images as a matrix of pixels, or it could be flattened into a long vector. And then we'll make a prediction as to what the label is. And the way that we will be encoding these labels is called a one-hot encoding. That is for the labels we give you, we'll give you a binary vector of length 10, and there'll be a one in the position that corresponds to that particular number, and zero at all the other positions. When you make an estimate y hat, you won't give back a one hot encoding, you'll give back a, an encoding that actually gives you probabilities for each one of the 10 possibilities. The most likely one will be the one that would be selected, but you'll give probabilities for all 10 of the options. Now, we're going to talk uh, primarily today about two kinds of machine learning tasks, um, classification and regression. Uh, in classification, we want to identify a label for an object that we're given, and we could uh, identify a single label, right? And it could be say zero or one, it could be a binary, binary classifier. It could be a multi-class classifier. We could have labels one through K, which is what, uh, for example, our um, MNIST digit task really is. We're trying to identify which one of the 10 digits it is. Or it could be a multi-label classification. That is, we could be, could be that a given image, for example, has both a dog and a cat in it and we want to be able to assign both labels to the image if it has both of those animals present. So once again, binary classification, multi-class classification, multi-label classification. Those are very good terms for you to remember so that as you're developing your own tasks, you can figure out which one of those three kinds of classifications you want to use. In the case of regression, we typically are trying to predict a continuous value, and we have a set of features to predict that value. 
And it might be that we want to predict a single output, or we want to predict more than one output. For example, um, in work, if you're working on antibodies, for example, you might want to predict out the back end of your model the affinity of a particular antibody sequence for a given target. You also might want to have a single model that outputs affinity for multiple targets or for a target and an off target probability. So there are that kind of model would be a sort of a multivariate regression kind of model. And finally, let's say that you have data where there is no label, right? Somebody comes to you and says, hey, you know, I've got this really great single cell RNA-seq data that I think is very interesting, but I need help interpreting it. And you say, okay, great. Well, what kind of ground truth can you give me about what the cell would you think? Oh, it's interesting, right? In that case, you might want to do some sort of clustering analysis as shown on the right-hand side here, where you take your data and you organize it by essentially similarity of objects. Okay, so, um, so we've already talked a little bit about problems at one, where we are going to take in our input and classify uh, an unseen digit into one of 10 possible classes, and we're gonna use softmax regression, which we'll talk about in just a few slides. Now, there are all sorts of objective functions that we can think about for judging the performance of a particular task. Some are more appropriate for like an accuracy metric at the very end, saying how accurate is something. Others are more appropriate for actually tuning the function to improve its parameters and fit. So typically we'll use likelihood-based metrics for adjusting parameters and making a function better fit the observed experience that we have. On the other hand, we might uh, revert to things like accuracy to talk about sort of the end performance. How many digits did we get right out of the ones that we classified? So, during our class, we'll be talking about different ways of thinking about introducing objective functions. Uh, but a lot of uh, our uh, metrics for tuning the algorithms themselves, actually doing parameter discovery, are going to be uh, negative log likelihood, which means that smaller, more negative answers are better, right? OK. So. One loss is just a zero and one loss, which is just simply saying, how many of the examples did you get right? So you count, um, say, if it's a loss, it would be the number of things you got wrong. A different kind of um, metric would be something called the binary cross entropy loss. And here's the final idea, right? You have a probability, say, for a particular occurrence, and you ask, how well does that fit your data? So we're asking, what is the probability of the observed data given what the model has predicted? So in the case of a binary choice, this could be expressed as, as a Bernoulli distribution. We're asking, what is the probability of Y, which is the actual label, given Y hat, which is what we're predicting? What we would like to do is to maximize the likelihood that the labels that uh, we're training on are accurately predicted by the model. So the model's predicting the Y hats. We actually want that to be a way to maximize the probability that we see the actual loop is Y. And this um, Bernoulli distribution is a, one way to think about that. Any questions about that so far? Okay. So, if we look at this uh, Bernoulli distribution, and what we do is we take its log, and we negate it, make a negative log likelihood, and we sum it over all of the examples we're considering during training, we wind up with this form of it, right? Which is a loss that corresponds to all of our experience in the training set. And so, if you look at the form of that, is simply if you just take the log of the Bernoulli equation above, and you sum over all the examples, 
falls out, it's exactly what you get. So this cross entropy loss is used everywhere. So cross entropy loss is something that's important for you to know in general. Uh, this is the binary case of it. There's also a case uh, for uh, uh, multi-class classification, which we'll talk about in a moment. So here's an example of loss calculations. Uh, you see the one hot encoded information on the left-hand side. You see the predictions uh, in the middle. You can see the red text indicates things that we have gotten wrong. And the um, uh, loss the is the zero one loss is shown as just the number of things we have gotten wrong, and the cross entropy loss is the log likelihood. Okay. So when we're talking about uh, more complicated things and binary classifiers, for example, then we have a categorical cross entropy loss. Uh, which means that we're going to actually consider all the possible categories. For example, in our digit classification, we have zero through nine is all the different categories. And thus, uh, we use the equation shown above, which is really a very simple generalization of the binary case. And that allows us to compute a loss uh, over Uh, particular, and in this case, experiment. Now, we'll see how the important thing about defining a machine learning task is coming up with an appropriate loss function that allows you to know when you're succeeding and allows you to improve the parameters uh, iteratively. So another possible loss for regression um, is mean squared error. This corresponds, uh, assuming that the variables are normally distributed, as once again a likelihood uh, characterization. If you think about the equation for the normal distribution, if you take the log and the exponential falls out, this uh, squared term is really all that's left aside from constants. So if you take the log of the of the normal, and so that represents um, a likelihood in the case of normally distributed variables. And so this is a very common likelihood-based metric used for. Uh, improving uh, regression-based models. Or we could go for mean absolute error, which is another way to think about loss, um, which is not uh, likelihood-based. And you can see here are some examples of uh, predicted values and uh, actual labels and the corresponding losses between them. Now, what we would like to do when we're discovering our function f is to do uh, what's known as empirical risk minimization. In a perfect world, we would have a probability distribution that described uh, the probability over all of our possible labels and the features that, that describe them. But we don't really have that, right? We have to um, make do with a particular set of functions or constrain our set of functions to learn uh, a, a set of parameters to model between the features and the labels. So instead of using a general distribution P of X of Y over respectively the features and the labels, we're gonna use our training set and we're going to, for example, pick a particular class of models uh, to use to learn their parameters to be able to improve using our loss function. So the way that we're going to do optimization is if you think about our loss function, uh, typically we're gonna pick loss functions that um, have derivatives. And if we can take a derivative of the loss function with respect to the parameters of our function we're trying to fit, we can do what's called uh, gradient ascent, which means that we can change our parameters based upon the error present between our predictions and the actual label values. So our loss function is giving us a loss that tells us how badly we're doing matching our labels. If we take its derivative, we get uh, a way to actually understand how to change our parameters. We take the derivative of the loss in terms of the parameters 
of our function. And then we iteratively make small steps. And you see that there's a lambda uh, behind me on multiplying the actual derivative. So we don't want to overshoot the right answer. What we want to do is to make very small steps and get closer and closer to the right set of parameters that optimally fit. Now, I'm showing here a concave um, function. Actually, it's a, a, in general, um, we want to find answers in the case where these sorts of solutions can't be found necessarily uniquely. So we're gonna be typically working with what are known as non-convex functions or non-convex optimization. We'll talk about how to, to deal with that. The central idea, however, is that by computing derivatives, we can make progress towards learning the right parameters to fit our functions to the data. So to that end, we have our training set. And as we begin training, our loss will continue to go down as we continue our, our training. Meantime, our possible trade, which means that we overfit. And so if we hold out another set called the validation set, we can use that to actually understand when um, we are overfitting and as a consequence, the performance in the validation set, which is not used to fit the parameters, starts to degrade. You can see here on the right-hand side that the validation set performance is degrading, and thus we might stop training before we get to overfit. And we'll be talking about the trade-off in terms of the amount of data you need, train um, a function, uh, and what happens to the held out error as, as a function of that. But as you can see here, uh, we need to be mindful of how hard we train to ensure that we don't overfit. I mean, one of the interesting properties of these kinds of models is that they may have thousands or even tens of thousands of parameters. As a consequence, unlike typical models where you actually need to have many more observations and you have parameters, sometimes in these models, you, know, you even have more parameters than you do have observations. And thus the model really has a great deal of flexibility to fitting the data. One of the things we have to be wary of in that case is typically when we're training data, the data is coming from a training distribution. And it will do well as long as future examples we give it to classify come from within that distribution. However, if we were to give it out of distribution examples, it might do very poorly indeed. And so one of the things that we need to be aware of when we're training these kinds of models is what's in distribution, what's out of distribution, and how to make sure that um, we understand the limitations of the model we've built. And we'll talk about a little bit later on in the term about uncertainty metrics. That is, how do you build a model that tells you not only what the point estimate is for a particular value, let's say if you're doing regression, what is the point estimate of the value of the regression, but also how certain is it of that value, right? What standard deviation or other kind of error metric can it provide to you to tell you how well it's doing? And when you give it out of distribution data, you want to actually give you a very large error metric indicating that really it actually is not very knowledgeable about that part of the input distribution space. Okay, so let's talk um, about the confusion matrix. The confusion matrix has a confusing name in my opinion, <laughs> but the confusion matrix is, those, is the four elements in the middle, the false positives, <clears throat> true positives, false negatives, and true negatives. Um, when you think about just counting the number of occurrences of each one of those when you're actually trying to do a classification task. And the accuracy is the overall number of things you got right over all of the number of objects that you're looking at. Uh, but the, there are different ways of looking at these metrics and different kinds of curves we can construct for a classifier based upon them. But it's very important that you understand and remember how to compute things like precision, F1 score, recall sensitivity and specificity given a particular set of performance numbers. 
So when we think about what's known as a receiver operating characteristic curve, which came from radio receivers, right, which is a way to think about how faithfully information can be transferred across a channel. Uh, if you imagine that we have our true, uh, say our positive and negative examples, and each one of those generates a distribution of predictions uh, shown on the upper left-hand corner of the screen as those two peaks, then we can slide a decision boundary uh, across here, and at any particular decision boundary, we're gonna make a um, decision about all of the values based upon where they fall, with, where their metric falls on, on, the, on either side of that line. And when we, when we do that, so for example, on the, if the line is all the way to the right, everything will be classified negative. And if the line's all the way to the left, everything will be classified positive. Right? But if everything's classified positive, let's say the line's all the way to the right and everything's classified positive, that means that all the negatives will be classified positive as well, right? So the false positive rate will be very high. So that means that if the line's all the way to the left, you're at the upper right-hand corner of that ROC curve. And when the line's on the other side, all the way to the right, you're at the lower left-hand corner of the ROC curve. Okay? Um, so the idea is that we're going to slide this line back and forth, this decision boundary, to allow us to actually compute um, this receiver operating characteristic and observe it. Now, assuming that we have balanced classes, if you're flipping a coin, you do right, you, you, you'd be correct half of the time. And thus, your ROC curve would look like the dotted line right there as a random classifier. And the further you go up to the upper left, you get better and better at classifying. And the area under this curve is one metric that's used to actually judge how well a classifier is doing. You'll hear people say, my AU ROC is 0.8, right? Well, you know, 0.5, of course, is, means that you're doing really terribly, right? Because that's random. Assuming you balance classes. Now, you have to be very careful, however, because if you have way more positives than negatives, let's say, you're going to you're going to do better at this metric, right? Because your true positive rate will be good, even if you're making random choices. So you need to be mindful that this metric um, is not perfect, and sometimes people will downsample uh, their observations to balance classes to allow the classification um, metric like this to, to work better. Now, another curve is a precision recall curve where precision is on the y-axis and recall is on the x-axis. I've once again repeated the definitions of precision and recall here. And the reason this is interesting is that as you try and recall all of the positive examples that you have, you can see how what's going on is the precision is falling off. Now, precision is also called the positive predicted value, positive predicted value, PPV. That's just the fraction of positive predictions that are really positive, right? So the way to think about this kind of graph is that you want it to actually have a good positive predictive value or precision as you get more and more recall of all of the positive examples. So ROC curves and PRC curves are the two different curves that are typically used for classification analysis. And if you put them on the same plot, you can see the purple line is the ROC curve flipped and mirrored, and they are telling you different things about the underlying classifier. But you'll find that uh, in one of the problem sets, I think you actually compute an ROC curve. I think that's true, right? Yeah. So you'll get an opportunity to compute these and uh, see how they work. Okay. Now, We've talked about classification metrics. Let's talk about regression metrics for a moment. Pearson correlation is something I'm sure you all have heard of. You know, one way to think about computing it is to take a, a vector x and subtract its mean from every element of the vector. Take a vector y and subtract its mean from every element of the vector. For both of these vectors, you normalize them um, by their lengths, and then you take their dot product. 
and that gives you the correlation uh, between the observations, the Pearson correlation. And so when we think about that, that's the cosine of the angle between uh, the two vectors. Um, you take the arc cosine of R and you'll get the, the angle. Um, and R squared turns out to be the fraction of variance explained um, by a linear model. So it's one way to analyze how well you're doing. Now you can see these different plots and the different values of correlation uh, between the dots. And uh, this is a, a useful statistic, but how do we know how significant a correlation is? Does anybody have any idea? How would we go about analyzing? If I told you a correlation was uh, say 0.8 for my data set, we're having lunch. Would you, what would you ask me about to determine how significant that was? Ideas? How many people like 0.8, just in general? I like people like 0.8, okay. Okay. Yes, you. Could you like bootstrap through like have big subsets of the data and encapsulate it on different subsets of the data? So like, yeah, you can bootstrap. I mean, another way to do this is to take your data, let's say you have X and you have the predictions Y, is you just permute the predictions you've made, right? And you compute the correlation coefficient. And you do that a thousand times. And you compute empirical distribution of the correlation coefficients you get by randomization. And then you ask, what is the probability I would have seen the correlation that I have at this level or higher in my randomization? And that gets you a very good estimate of how likely um, your correlation is, right? To have occurred by, by chance. So randomization is a wonderful technique for all sorts of questions about significance. Right? Randomizing things and permuting them allows you to stop from fooling yourself. And fooling ourselves is something that happens all the time. Okay, another metric is Spearman rank correlation. Here you can see that the, the Pearson correlation for these data points, X and Y is only 0.8, but the Spearman correlation is perfect. Uh, and the way that the Spearman correlation works is we simply um, take the Pearson correlation of the rank values. So we rank the values X and Y from smallest to largest, and then we could compute the correlation. And for fractional ranks, uh, we, I'm sorry, for ties, we, we assign fractional ranks. <coughs> and once again, we can look at ways of computing significance doing randomization, or alternatively, um, we can compute a test statistic. Now, a test statistic is a function of a metric that we have computed. Here we are talking about computing a test statistic um, from a correlation value R. And these test statistics are distributed according to different distributions. The correlation test statistic is distributed as the student T distribution with n minus two degrees of freedom, where n is the number of observations in our original correlation computation. So if we compute the test statistic t, which is equal to r times the square root of n minus two over one minus r squared as shown on the slide, we get a test statistic that we ask, uh, assuming that the correlation occurred at random, uh, the test statistic will tell us what the likelihood is that that correlation would have occurred uh, by looking at the distribution of the test statistic and then integrating from that point outward. So we we're looking for a test statistic that's either equal to the one we got or anything larger. So is it that this occurred completely by a small, right? 0.05 is a typical value. Then we will reject the fact that it happened to chance and we'll accept that we've made a discovery. So once again, we compute a test statistic, say from our correlation. We look at the distribution of the test statistic, which assumes that things occurred at random. And we ask whether or not we should accept the null hypothesis, right? which is that, in fact, 
the correlation is spurious and occurred at random, or we should reject the null hypothesis and accept that we've made a discovery. And the way we do that is by looking at where the test statistic lies on this curve, and we integrate from that point outwards for a statistic that's either equal to or greater than it. And the test statistic curve, once again, represents the distribution of test statistics that occurred at assuming that things happened at random. Okay? So this is called a one-sided test, which means that we're testing to see whether or not, say, a correlation is above a particular value, or for example, if we're doing a pair t-test, whether or not um, a particular observation is larger than another one. If we want to do two-tailed tests, we are now comparing uh, for a difference regardless of the direction, whether it's greater than or less than, in which case we are looking at both tails. And you note that what happens is that if our significance level is 0.05, that is that we want to say that we're going to accept the discovery if the chance that it occurred um, at random was 0.05 or lower, then we only get to allocate half of that area, 0.025, to each one of these tails. So it's important for us when we're making a decision about, you know, what kind of uh, test we're going to do, whether or not we want to just test for an effect in one direction or an effect. Okay. Now, classifier significance test, we could use a binomial test for this, which is that imagine that we um, have a probability P that the classifier made the correct choice at random. So we have a series of choices coming out of our classifier and we're flipping this coin, right? And essentially we're asking how many times it comes up heads, how many times it's made the right choice. And the number of heads um, after n trials um, is equal to uh, the distribution shown, right? And so we can then ask, what's the uh, chance that we got n heads or more at ch by, by chance? And so if we look at the number of correct decisions we have made, and we look at the probability that the classifier would make that correct choice at random, then we can compute the probability that the classifier would actually have perform that well at random. Now, why is P not equal to 0.5? Or when is P not equal to 0.5, I should say? The chance of the classifier will make a correct choice at random. Yeah. You have more than just two options. So is there any test? More than two options? Okay. Well, the other possibility is that the data set is skewed, right? And the classifier knows that, you know, let's just say that you have 80% of the time, you know that um, you have one label and not the other one. Then the classifier would be intelligent saying it's always going to say it's going to be. Um, guesses that everything is of that class because that's more likely. So if you have a skewed data set, then your classifier can do better than, um, than guessing 50-50. It's still random, but it's, it's doing better only because the classes are skewed. Okay, now, multiple hypothesis correction. When we're asking questions in high throughput biology, typically in large scale multiplex experiments, we're testing many hypotheses at once. And so even though the chance that any one of them happens is small, if we test a thousand things, the chance is much greater than one of them happens randomly by chance. So we need to adjust for this. So if we consider P sub single, is the probability that something happens by chance, uh, then we know that if we have many different um, tests that we're asking at the same time, that the chance that 
any of them might have occurred um, by chance is bounded. Uh, and we could take our original probability of some things occurring by chance, multiplying it by the number of tests that we're doing. And that is a bound on the corrected probability that things occurred by chance. And one way to uh, evaluate each one of our tests is to take our desired level of significance and divide it by the number of tests. So for example, if we have a 0.05 desired level of significance, and we're doing five tests, that means that now each test has to be significant to 0.01 for us to actually accept it and say, we're gonna reject the null hypothesis and declare a discovery. Okay, and you can see if you take that very last equation and substitute it in for P single above, um, it satisfies the inequality. So it's a very simple way to uh, adjust for doing multiple tests, you know, as the Bonferroni correction. Another way to correct for multiple hypotheses is to do what's called as a Benjamin Hochberg uh, correction, which corrects for a false discovery rate. So if you have a desired false discovery rate, the rate at which you're making false discoveries, you're rejecting the null hypothesis. Let's say you have a number of tests, H1 through HM, and you have their p-values in uh, ascending order. So that means that the first test is the most significant one, is the smallest p-value. Chances occurred at random is very small, let's say. You find the largest k such that p sub k is less than or equal to k over m times alpha, which is your discovered your desired false discovery rate. And you reject the null hypothesis and declare discoveries for one through K. So this is giving you an advantage right now. Does it give you advantage of the very first test? The very first test that is for H1. Are you getting any benefit over Bonferroni? Well, the very first test is you're making sure that the test's p-value is less than alpha over m, which is really the same thing we were doing above, right? So for the very first test, you don't get any benefit. But for the second test, you get a factor of two. And for the third test, a factor of three benefit, and a fourth test, a factor of four, right? So let's just think about this for a moment. Here's, here's a question for you. So we have four, five transcription factors that bind with um, <clears throat> the following single test p-values, which ones bind with a corrected significance of 0.05? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What do you think? Okay. Let's start with um, Bonferroni, okay? How you doing there, back row? You good? Everything really good? Right up until about now? <laughs> no, that's a joke. Um, so what is the p-value that we're gonna need to see for a test to be significant if we're doing five tests and our desired level of significance is 0.05? No, it's the, it's the third line. The, the single test has to be P corrected over M. M is five. That's the number of tests we're doing, right? We ask M questions. 0 .01. 0 .01, okay. So which one of these transcription factors bind with that level of significance that we can reject the null hypothesis and declare a discovery? One and two. I'd go with that, okay? One and two. So one and two now came out of this data. It's already been published, but now, you know, we need to sort of get some more mileage out of it. See, he's laughing because he knows this story too well, right? <laughs> so, yes. Well, if I take the Benjamin Hochberg uh, correction, then I can also attribute three or four, three or two, because I have three over five. 
that give me a test of zero point zero three in order to develop that. Good. So right. So if we use the Benjamin Hotchberg um, correction, we actually get the th first three transcription factors are significant up to our false discovery rate, right? Right. Bonferroni first two, Benjamin Hotchberg three, first three. Okay. Is that clear to everybody? Just want to make sure, right? This is our book. Okay. Okay. So. Now, however, I want to um, show you something. This is actually a rather tragic graph. Um, I'm not sure you're aware of this fact, but it, a little known fact is that people um, who get tangled in their bed sheets are having nightmares because they do a lot of skiing and they actually tragically die. Yeah, it, I don't know if you knew that or not, but yeah, this, these tragic deaths are thus very well correlated with the revenue generated in skiing facilities. So if you look at the correlation between number of people dying, being tangled in their bed sheets, and the skiing revenue generated per year, you can see that they're exactly matched for this very fact, right? Well, not really, right? So although the correlation could be very significant, and all of our tests are going to show it's significant, it actually is spurious, right? And how can we overcome this? I'm asking you now as our assembled panel of experts, if somebody came to you and they had a very high correlation and they showed it was significant, but it was observational only, right? They were just observing the number of people who died in their beds from being tangled in their bed sheets and the amount of revenue generated from ski resorts, right? Not for this particular example, say, but for a biological experiment, how could you understand what is causing a particular effect? What's important to do? Yes? You need a controlled experiment. A controlled experiment. You need to do an intervention, right? You need to actually perturb the system and observe the result and be able to control, as you said, um, the intervention to relate to the factor that you consider to be causal. And so causal reasoning means that we need to actually do these kinds of perturbations to be able to get at what's, under, what's going on in the system. Okay, now, uh, this is an interesting um, set of plots. Uh, one thing that's always important is to plot your data when you see it, yes? Yes. So one of the major criticisms about DNA is machine learning algorithms is that uh, after they recognize patterns, they try to figure what those patterns correlate to and fix the conditions. But then, uh, as uh, for all the many ages, particularly when working with complex systems, there are no idea of such mechanical systems. So what what was your comment? The machine learning algorithm, what's your specific um, query that they... Yeah, that, 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 that is one of the major criticisms that basically what they do is correlation, not causation, of, uh, and, co and correlation or association is not causation. And when we're working with complex systems characterized by nonlinear interactions, uh, just uh, linear operations or linear relationships or core relationships like that. So how do we go around that? Um, how do we actually come up with the relevant information based on correlation? Okay, so your question is, let me see if I can repeat this back to you to make my data right, which is that um, a concern is that, let's say the machine learning algorithm is very well predicting a particular lead, right? The people will then describe um, the features that are used to predict as the cause of the label because they had a very good correlation as it, that, they, that the metrics they're using for performance are showing that the algorithm is working very well, okay? Well, in my view, um, you would never be able to make a claim, a causal claim, that the features are driving why you're seeing the label, right? And, you know, there's this old example of machine learning, right? Which is they had a task for classifying tanks. People heard of this before? They had this, early on, they had this perfect tank classifier. It would always be able to tell an image with a tank in it absolutely perfectly, right? 
Uh, and people will say, wow, this thing is amazing. You know, I showed an image, bang, it's always bang on. It can tell whether there's a tank there or not. And then they figured out after a while that all the tank pictures were taken at a different time of day, right? And actually had nothing to do with the tanks at all, that there was a confounder. And so what we're gonna talk about later on are confounders, unobserved variables, and how do we um, interpret a machine learning model to figure out which features are really important so we can go back and perturb those features, right? If we can't perturb the features and see a change in the result, we're never really going to know whether or not they're actually causally responsible for the result that we're seeing. I'm with you, okay? <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, well this brings us to the Datasaurus dozen. Okay, how many people have seen this before? Anybody? Okay, well, <clears throat> the point of this is to say you should always plot your data, right? Because the first thing that we should do is understand what our data looks like, and we'll have a whole discussion about cleaning our data because most of the time you're given data that is in fairly pristine form. It's been heavily curated, uh, but when you're working with your own data, it's not gonna be that way at all, and you're gonna deal with sequencing errors and other artifacts that actually are going to bias things. But suffice to say, Plotting your data is a good idea. So the top picture of our dino friend up there, right, uh, is, would be a surprising result if you plotted your data and you saw that, right? You'd say, ooh, that's very interesting. Maybe we should get into paleontology or something, right? But at any rate, um, if you plot the data, you can, of course, generate summary statistics from it. The summary statistics would include its mean in x direction, y direction, its standard deviations, and the correlation of the x and y axes, which in the case is minus 0 0.06, right? Now, all 12 of the other plots, um, do they look anything like the plot above? No. Would you be surprised if I told you their summary statistics were exactly identical? They all have the same mean in X in Y, the same standard deviation in X and Y, and the same correlation, right? So the way this was done was to actually take the original dino plot up there and to move the points around with an algorithm that preserved the statistics the, um, and have different figures as attractors to actually move the points towards those attractors to be able to get them to look like different things, right? So the curious thing, of course, is that you can make a dinosaur look like lots of other things, but nothing changes in the statistics. If I gave you the, the statistics for these various plots, you couldn't tell them apart because they're all identical, right? So just to summarize then, What's gonna happen in this class is that on Thursday, we're gonna take a deep dive into how to do optimization of neural networks. And next week, we'll talk about convolutional neural networks and uh, front neural networks. And in recitation this week, hopefully you'll be able to get there, uh, we will get you completely started up with your own computing environment and get you well on your way to solving problem set number one, which is already posted. And if you have any questions about anything, please feel free to email the staff. Uh, if you have questions about your background, please feel free to come on up and chat with us afterwards. Okay. And I think that's it, except that these are all of the different things that we're gonna be dealing with during the rest of the term, which include all these different kinds of neural networks, different kinds of ways of regularizing them, um, how to do model selection, model interpretation, which relates to your question about how do you figure out which features are really driving a decision? How do we incorporate uncertainty into a model? How do we have a model tell us when it doesn't know what it doesn't know? And how can we use these kinds of methodologies for dimensionality reduction, where we're taking a very high dimensional data set, like a gene expression data set that may have 20,000 observations and compress it down to something that's easier to deal with. And we'll also be talking about hyperparameter optimization and um, learning about learning or auto ML. 
Okay, well, thank you very much, and we'll see you on Thursday.